Hello, everyone. Welcome back for part two. We're going to continue discussing Turn It Down, music that's been banned. Um, we're going to turn our attention to opera. Um, and I know on your lecture sheet, I've uh, listed that we were going to do the shows to Kovic first. I think we're going to take a little bit more of a historical approach. We're going to talk about uh, Richard Strauss's Salome, uh, which you guys hopefully all read about in your reading assignment, um, which was uh, Alex Ross's, the first two chapters of Alex Ross's The Rest is Noise. Um, so the first chapter deals uh, uh, a little bit with uh, uh, Strauss's uh, controversial opera, uh, Salome. Um, probably one of the most controversial parts of Salome is a instrumental sequence uh, that's called the Dance of the Seven Veils. Um, so interesting that it is a wordless or textless uh, spot within the, the larger story arc here that is um, uh, as seen as one of the 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 the, the more um, not problematic but more perhaps risque uh, for the time um, elements of the performance. So, gosh, I can't tell you guys like I have seen Salome done in a number of different ways, and the staging of the Dance of the Seven Veils is always um, a very interesting choice, and I've seen so many different kinds of versions of it. So it was very hard to figure out which one I wanted to play for you. And even then, I'm not playing, I'm not going to play it in its entirety. It's, a, um, it's over seven minutes uh, long and um, fairly, fairly drawn out. Uh, and uh, the end is, um, well, anyway, I will let you uh, uh, do your own investigative research if you if you wish to see the end of the Seven Veils dance. But in order to kind of appreciate what the Seven Veils dance even is, or Dance of the Seven Veils, um, we kind of need to figure out what Salome's story is to begin with. So um, like we did for uh, Votesec, the same company um, has cut, put together a synopsis of what happens in Salome. So uh, we can we can discuss uh, the dance of the seven veils. So, give me a, me a moment. I'm going to go toggle over to my other screen so that we can play a synopsis of what happens in Richard Strauss's very romantic slash turn of the 20th century um, opera. Salome uh, is all about. Hold on. All right. So here we go. Um, Salome, like I said, uh, premieres in 1905, a very um, interesting time. Obviously, it's pre-World War I, um, so Wozzeck uh, had a, a much different kind of uh, narrative and harmonic language, uh, but uh, this is going to kind of foreshadow some things that are to come. Anyway, here's a synopsis of Strauss's Salome. This opera is really great because you might think you're getting three hours of this. <sighs> But what you're actually getting is just about an hour and a half of this. But what is Salome actually about? Our story begins at the Palace of Herod, with Salome stepping out of a party for a breath of fresh air. Man, these parties are really lame. I wish there was some kind of attractive piece of eye candy for my wanton eyes to feast upon. Maybe there's someone in our prison that might fit the bill. Enter the prophet Yohanaan, who's brought up from his prison cell at Salome's request. He's coming. And let me tell you, this guy is awesome. Like, way more awesome than I am. <laughs> Let's face it, I'm pretty awesome. He's going to help blind people see and help other people who can't do various things do those things that they can't do. Hey, so you're really attractive and- Oh, oh Salome, I'ma let you finish, but seriously, some kid is going to touch a dragon. I mean, the horsemen have gone into the rivers and the mermaids have left the rivers, which is- Have you ever considered wearing a veil? Eventually, Salome's stepfather slash uncle Herod enters with his wife slash ex-sister-in-law, Herodias. Is it just me or is Salome like super hot? Like I mean crazy hot for a stepdaughter. Is that weird? Is that a little creepy? Uh, I'm not just imagining that, right? Oh, you're such a creep. Oh, here comes Salome. <clears throat> hey, how about you and I get a bite together? Get to know each other, see where the night takes us. You, as if. Maybe dance for daddy. Just a little dance for daddy. Daddy will give you a present. 
anything I want? Everything, We're gonna I promise. What happens next is the opera's most famous scene, the Dance of the Seven Veils. That was so hot! Oh my god, thank you for that! Now what can I do for you? What do you want? I would like the head of the Prophet Yukana on served to me on a silver platter. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Look, sweetie, God kind of speaks through him, so I don't know if it's a good idea if we did But that. you promised! Eventually, Salome gets her way, and Yukana on's head is brought to her on a silver platter. Alone at last. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This is way too creepy! I never signed up for this! Okay, stop, stop! This is too much! This was a huge mistake! Yokana on, my apologies. Salome, we're gonna have to kill you too. Wait, what? And that's essentially how the opera ends. Um, so... Wow, 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 what an opera! Um, I, I have yet to give you guys your uh, concert report assignment. Um, one of them could be to watch Salome. Um, you have to watch a performance and write a little bit about it. Um, it's, again, not a really tough assignment, but if you found this intriguing, I would say you should watch Salome in its entirety. It's, um, it's a, a lot of an opera, for sure. Um, so, this Dance of the Seven Veils. Um, Obviously, because it's a choreographed section of the opera, it leaves a lot to the uh, director's uh, discretion in terms of what to do. So, I have picked one of many performances that are, uh, that are out there of um, the Dance of the Seven Veils. So, I will, I will play it for you. What is happening here is that, like, we have music that's, that's really shifting in terms of its harmonic language. The turn of the century is a really interesting point, meaning the turn, like 1800s into 1900s. Um, we have composers on the other side of the 1900s, like Schoenberg, for example, experimenting with the idea of like tonality. Do we have to work with tonality? But obviously before then, like there are other composers who are really stretching the boundaries of what tonal music even is. Um, I believe I talked to you guys about the chocolate chip cookie, the idea that, um, Tonality is like baking a perfect kind of chocolate chip cookie where there is indeed a little bit of salt that's added to the chocolate chip cookie um, recipe. So what does salt do? It helps bring out the sweetness. In my analogy, uh, salt is dissonance and sugar is consonance. This idea of like that you need a little bit of dissonance in order to bring out what's happening in consonance. Romantic and 20th century composers are interested in messing around with the recipe, adding a, a little bit too much salt. So much salt that it kind of starts to distract, dis, detract from the, the sweetness of the cookie. Um, so what was perhaps being presented as a dessert uh, or something that's sweet is now tasting a little bit more savory. Um, so what are we going to hear in that regards? We're going to hear things that sound safe, that sound tonal, that sound functional, but they are colored with a little bit more of this salt that I'm talking about. Um, so here's one of many renditions and just like the first five minutes of the dance, um, after which she asks for, um, for the, um, the the severed head as a as a as a gift for doing this amazing uh, dance of the seven veils, um, I will play one of them for you. Um, and again, like I said, if you are intrigued by by this as a narrative, check out the whole opera or other versions of the seven veils dance. So, one moment. All right, here we go. Richard Strauss's Dance of the Seven Veils. Um, I hope you enjoy it. This is a very multimedia uh, uh, version and one that like is not is sent in, is set in more contemporary times. Um, what what's interesting is uh, what is being projected is like sort of the inner monologue that's happening with our main character. Um, 
uh, an interesting directorial choice um, because uh, usually this is kind of done as like a seduction scene kind of where everyone is watching. Um, it's also like a big power scene, obviously. Um, but there's, there's a lot that's left up to the um, imagination because it is just purely instrumental and a fairly long instrumental section of that. In any event, let's check out the Dance of the Seven Veils as performed by um, the National Opera and Ballet Company.
cool. Um, it, it, it works itself, in, itself up into a real big uh, fury. Like, obviously, this is not done with veils. There are plenty of other traditional versions where there are seven veils that are uh, indeed used. Um, there are some where just one veil is used. Uh, so um, the internet has a grand offering of different versions of uh, Salome um, and specifically stagings uh, and renditions of the Dance of the Seven Veils. This was a more modern, modern take on it. Um, it's supposed to be about uh, a lot about power though. Uh, and we have a lot of this uh, kind of untamed energy that we hear in the accompaniment part. Um, and uh, that's that kind of feeling of moving from consonance to dissonance. So this predates what's happening only by a little bit. Um, with the second Viennese school. So we talked about the first Viennese school and we talked about the second Viennese school and there's a lot of time in between. So like if these are those two groups, like this is happening like right, right before the second Viennese school is starting to hang out and do a lot of, a lot of really interesting work. Um, uh, Schoenberg really, uh, well, anyway, your reading has a lot to do with, with Salome. So please do your reading. Um, it'll give you a little bit more context on this piece in particular. Uh, rather than drag on and talk about uh, another opera, um, I am going to go ahead and uh, pa uh, stop this uh, and, and retake for another section where we're going to discuss um, Dmitry Shostakovich's uh, uh, opera Lady Macbeth, and um, uh, what's happening in terms of plot there, uh, and why it did not uh, uh, please the the Communist Party at the um, in the 1930s when it was uh, being publicly performed. So I will see you guys for part three shortly.